Khoshamadin, bienvenidos, welcome. You know, we're nearing the end of May, which is a rather busy month for us uh, nerdy types, because we have a couple holidays to celebrate. The most famous of these happened on the 4th. It's a celebration of Star Wars because May the 4th be with you. <laughs> we're so funny. Only slightly less well known is a holiday that happens on the 25th called Towel Day. Now, if you're not familiar with this holiday, you're probably thinking it's a time to lay a towel on the ground for a day at the beach, or perhaps just a picnic in your own backyard to enjoy the pleasures of late spring when the weather is warming, the lilacs are blooming, and most of the bugs haven't woken up yet. And you're wondering, what's so nerdy about that? Well, let me explain. Towel Day is a celebration of the author Douglas Adams, whose most famous work is the hilarious science fiction comedy, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The guide strongly recommends that if you go hitchhiking across the galaxy, you should always bring a towel with you. A towel can serve many beneficial purposes for a resourceful hitchhiker, but perhaps the most beneficial is psychological. You see, people, especially people you're trying to hitch rides from, are more likely to consider you a trustworthy and reliable sort of person if you can hitchhike from one side of the galaxy to the other and still know where your towel is. In celebration of this holiday, I'm going to read you an excerpt from one of Adams's books, not The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> I hope I haven't disappointed you. I'm going to read from Last Chance to See, a book Adams co-wrote with a zoologist Mark Carwardine. See, Adams and Carwardine went around the world looking for and learning about endangered species. Uh, the selection I'm going to read today is about Douglas's, Douglas Adams's. <laughs> anyway, about Adams's encounter with a mountain gorilla. Mm -mm. Right. <clears throat> I began to feel just how patronizing it was of us to presume to judge their intelligence, as if ours was any kind of standard by which to measure. I tried to imagine instead how he saw us, but of course that's almost impossible to do, because the assumptions you end up making as you try to bridge the imaginative gap are, of course, your own, and the most misleading assumptions are the ones you don't even know you're making. I pictured him lying there easily in his own world, tolerating my presence in it, but, I think, possibly sending me signals to which I did not know how to respond. And then I pictured myself beside him, festooned with the apparatus of my intelligence, my Gore-Tex windbreaker, my pen and paper, my autofocus matrix metering Nikon F4, and my inability to comprehend any of the life we had left behind us in the forest. But somewhere, in the genetic history that we each carry with us in every cell of our body was a deep connection with this creature, as inaccessible to us now as last year's dreams, but like last year's dreams, always invisibly and unfathomably present. It put me in mind of what I think must be a vague memory of a movie in which a New Yorker, the son of East European immigrants, goes to find the village that his family originally came from. He is rich and successful, and expects to be greeted with excitement, admiration, and wonder. Instead, he is not exactly rejected, not exactly dismissed, but is welcomed in ways that he is unable to understand. He is disturbed by their lack of reaction to his presence, until he realizes that their stillness in the face of him is not rejection, but merely a peace that he is welcome to join, but not disturb. The gifts he has brought with him from civilization turn to dust in his hands as he realizes that everything he has 
is merely the shadow cast by what he has lost. I watched the gorilla's eyes again, wise and knowing eyes, and wondered about this business of trying to teach apes language, our language. Why? There are many members of our own species who live in and with the forest and know it and understand it. We don't listen to them. What is there to suggest we would listen to anything an ape could tell us? Or that it would be able to tell us of its life in a language that hasn't been born of that life? I thought, maybe it is not that they have yet to gain a language. It is that we have lost one. Something to consider. Happy Tao Day, everybody. Khudafes, adios, and goodbye.